thanks to everyone for showing up today. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, this is a, a, an event that's taken us a while to plan, um, but I think it's going to do a very nice job of showcasing, you know, um, why quantum itself is of interest to so many these days, uh, what's going on nationally, regionally, and then locally here at Mesa, and how um, you guys can get involved. Uh, and and I, what I hope what I hope a lot of people take away from this is that you don't have to be a physicist. I'm a physicist, but it's very important to me that people know they don't need to be physicists or get a physics degree to have huge impact in this space. Um, so I, I guess I've used up 60 seconds, maybe, no? Should we wait a minute or two more? I'll keep talking. Um, this is great. Nobody can tell me to stop talking yet. I think thank you can though, because he has a mute button. But um, yeah, it's, it's a very exciting time and there's a lot of momentum going forward here at Mason. And honestly, one of our limiting factors for uh, achieving our, um, these research goals and these education goals in quantum is, is getting more people interested and getting them involved. So I hope we'll be able to, to convey that to all of y'all today. Um, my talk is gonna go 25-ish minutes, uh, but there should be plenty of time for questions at the end. And, um, and uh, uh, yeah, and we have a message to kick everything off from uh, Mason's Vice President of Research, Orly Dade. And uh, Fang Yu is gonna go ahead and, and play that for us now. Good morning, I'm Orly Dade. I'm the interim vice president for research, innovation and economic impact at George Mason. It is my pleasure to welcome fellow Mason patriots and our friends throughout the region to Mason's first annual quantum week. Over the next few days, you will learn about how this exciting new area of science and engineering is poised to transform the world as we know it. Experts in academia, industry and government will present their perspectives on the present state of quantum technology the research pushing this field forward, and the new career pathways available for Mason and other students. Here at Mason, we are committed to supporting new educational initiatives in K-12, as well as in higher education that will help our students find roles in this new quantum workforce and equitably prepare a new generation of young people for a quantum world. The Quantum Science and Engineering Center is one demonstration of this approach. We have had several center level competitions during the last few years to launch what we call transdisciplinary centers of advanced study. During the first highly competitive round, the Quantum Science and Engineering Center was one of two centers selected and funded by the university. The incredibly talented interdisciplinary Mason faculty are at the heart of QSEC, but they have also been highly successful in translating their work to research and educational programs and partnerships with local government, industry, and schools, academia, making it a true transdisciplinary center. You didn't come here today to hear me, so with no further ado, I will pass it back to the organizers to share their fabulous science and engineering knowledge with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, and thank you, Dr. Dade, for, for recording that video for us. And again, thanks to, to all of you for, for showing up today. It, it's a, it's a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to all y'all. All right, so I'm going to go um, share my screen now, and I'll get started on the propaganda remarks. So here we go. Laser pointer. Can you see my pointer? Yes. Ah, great. So yeah, this is this is Mason Quantum Week. You know, we celebrated it the, the whole week, but we're we're packing all our events into Thursday and Friday. Uh, and and so welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here. Uh, just so you know, my name is Patrick Fora. I'm an associate professor of physics here at George Mason, and I'm the director of our Quantum Science and Engineering Center. And as I mentioned preceding uh, Dr. Dade's video, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about you know what quantum is and why it's interesting. And if you you know don't worry, there won't be any equations associated with this. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So. In the world, right, we are all accustomed to interacting with big things, right? And a big thing could be a dog. You may have heard mine bark, right? And for my dog, um, you know, I can usually see 
where she is, right? I can know her position pretty accurately, how fast she's moving and how much energy ha she has based on the loudness of her bark and how crazily she's running around. Right. So I can know all these things with certainty when I'm dealing with macroscopic systems. And moreover, the length scales that I'm dealing with when I deal with big things are on the scale of meters. Right. And the times are on the scale of seconds, you know, milliseconds, you know, best case if you're if your uh, creature is, is quite fast. Right. So that that's the world we live in now. Right. And, and the rules of that world are um, pretty obvious to us. We learn them intuitively as we as we grow from a small baby, which you may have heard yelling um, into into big babies like, like myself who's giving this talk. Right? So um, uh, um, but things are very different at small length scales. And why shouldn't they be right? There's no reason our intuition about how things work for um, humans and, and other creatures of our, our size should match up with something that is uh, 10 to the minus 10 or 10, 10 to the 10 times smaller than length scales we typically interact with and has events happening uh, 10 to the nine, uh, uh, 10 to the minus nine seconds, right? And so for small things like atoms, like electrons, um, the rules are very, very different. The universe for atoms and electrons and so on is inherently fuzzy. You can't say with certainty ever um, the exact position and momentum of a given particle. Right? Instead, uh, everything is probabilistic. Right? So uh, we have probability distributions that tell us where a particle is most likely to be and how fast it is most likely to be going. Right. And there's another consequence of all this, too, and this is where the name quantum comes from. Instead of having a continuously uh, available a number of energy states, uh, energies are required to exist in discrete levels. So you can't have any energy you like. You have to have you know, either E1, either E2, either E3, and so on up the ladder here. All right. So this is a very different state of being than, um, than is experienced by big things, right? These rules are, are very confusing. And they, you know, when you carry them through, they lead to even more confusing and unexpected consequences, right? So you get wacky behaviors coming out of this. And this is probably the one that's, that's most uh, familiar to, to people. And it's the, this idea of quantum superposition. And, you know, so Schrodinger had a thing against cats, right, apparently. So he had this Gedanken, this thought experiment where he took a cat, Right, and um, he had a radioactive source that randomly emitted uh, uh, particles as it decays. Right, and um, when a particle is detected, it will cause a hammer to fall and break open a glass of poison and poison said cat. Um, now we put all this into a box, and so you know the cat is either dead or alive, but we don't know which state it is in. Whether it's and this is a quantum cat, by the way. Right, so everything's probabilistic. So there's a, a probability for the cat being alive and a probability for the cat being dead. But we don't know which is which until we open it. And this is the case of quantum systems. An electron can exist in multiple different quantum states. It can simultaneously have a probability of being in two different places at once. But until you measure it, you don't know which one it is. And so this idea of quantum superposition is, is really at the core of, of quantum physics. Right? And what else can happen? Well. Another cool thing is there's something called wave particle duality. So you might think about electrons and fundamental particles as little billiard balls, right? Or baseballs that you can throw around and they bounce off of each other. But what's really interesting is that when you interact them with each other, the wave aspects of these particles become manifest, right? And so what you end up seeing are interference patterns when you interact two electrons together, for instance. Um, that are reminiscent of water waves interfering with each other, kind of like as illustrated here in this image. And so instead of describing an electron or a photon or whatever, it's just a single point particle, there is actually uh, waviness to it. And it's kind of localized waviness. So it has a wave packet, um, which is what is being illustrated here, right? So there's the wave component within it, right? But it's localized in space. And so you, you combine those two pictures together, right? Now, finally, there's uh, quantum entanglement. And this is the one that is, I think, presently uh, most, most exciting 
uh, and and also most misinterpreted in some cases. But it, it's really fascinating, and it threw Einstein for a loop. He really didn't like this idea. Uh, and the idea is that if you take two particles and interact them, and then separate them, right? Uh, and it could be an arbitrary separation. I could take one to Alpha Centauri, and I could keep one here. Alpha Centauri is far away, by the way. It's for light years. Right? So I could take them far away. Now, I haven't measured them, so I don't know what state they're in. But because they've interacted with each other, if I measure one of them and determine its state, I immediately know the state of the other one over, an alpha, over on Alpha Centauri. Right? So it's a very spooky kind of behavior. It's kind of like action at a distance. Uh, and, and so all three of these things should bother you. They are not intuitive and they're not part of our daily experience, but they're true. Quantum theories are verified to a better degree than gravity. We know the constants for quantum physics, uh, quantum phenomena to a better degree of certainty than we do for gravity. So in that sense, it's a better theory. Okay. All right, so uh, we're here today to talk about technology though, right? And advancing our world, right? And so we're here to talk about revolutions, okay? And so, um, I, I, you know, what we're experiencing right now is the second quantum revolution. And so people are always like, what's the first? Well, the first, um, you know, started in around 1947, right? And in 1947, we demonstrated the first transistors. And the transistors were based upon understanding the properties of electrons in materials known as semiconductors, and then our ability to control those semiconductors. Right? And so um, what that allowed us to do was actually build uh, our first computers. And over time, those transistors got minimized smaller and smaller until we have the kind of uh, uh, you know, chips that we have today that are on all of our motherboards. Right? So the computer has obviously had a huge impact on our world. Um, in addition to computers though, lasers, the invention of lasers in 1960, yeah, 1960 has changed everything. Huge applications of lasers in, in everything from, you know, something as trivial as laser pointing, right, to uh, precision measurement technologies, right, to cutting, right, to, you think of it, you can name uh, an application of lasers. Right? So this is, this is a very, um, this first quantum revolution has spawned almost all of the technology that we enjoy today on a regular basis, including the technology that I'm talking to you on right now. So that was the first quantum revolution. Um, and in this quantum revolution, you know, we've, we've done all these things, but the quantumness has gone into more of making these devices operate. Um, the operations themselves, are more classical. In, in the case of a computer chip, it involves moving charge from one place to the other. But we can view the charge as billiard balls, and that's fine. We don't need to worry about the wave aspects. Okay. So what's happening now is quite different. This is being referred to as the second quantum revolution. And here, the technologies we're creating are actually based on using um, these strange quantum phenomena I just talked to you about, superposition states, entanglement, wave particle duality, actually using those to make new kinds of technology that trans that move us light years beyond what we can presently do. All right, so let's give some examples here. All right, uh, computing is the first one that springs to most people's minds, right? And so these are some key needs that ex are existing right now, right? We have computers, they do a pretty good job. Right? But there are a lot of problems that are just intractable for them, problems that would take on the age of the universe for a regular computer to solve. Um, you know, and there are ways to solve these problems with quantum. Right? One thing you can do is utilize, instead of a classical bit, which can be zero and one, you use a quantum bit, a qubit, uh, which can be simultaneously zero and one at the same time. And this can give you huge performance improvements. Right, for very specific problems, but like crazy high performance improvements. One aspect of it is that public key encryption will be rendered completely obsolete because a quantum number can do the prime fa number factorization so fast, you won't be able to come up with a key long enough to confuse it. Yeah. Yeah. Pivoting off that challenge to the security of, of our encryption, right? Um, you know, a present challenge again is you know, encryption of our communications. We're seeing data breaches more and more. Everything seems to be hackable. Right? Quantum states, though, actually provide a way to securely generate 
uh, keys in which you can exchange with yourself and your partner. Uh, and the security of that key is guaranteed by the quantum superposition state. And the fact that if you have a nefarious observer here named Eve in this case, who is measuring the states you're sending between Alice and Bob, Eve is going to change the outcome, right? She's going to project these quantum superposition states into known states. And when Eve and, and when Alice and Bob compare, they'll be able to tell if there was an observer. And finally, there are huge opportunities in sensing, right? Anytime you're trying to sense a phenomenon, you always want to push your sensitivity, you want to push your resolution, you want to make your sensors smaller, and you want to detect things more rapidly, right? These are, these are the, always the driving forces for new sensors. Quantum provides ways that you can potentially do that. If you can make a sensor using quantum entanglement, not only can you often boost your signal by orders of magnitude, but you can also detect new phenomena that you haven't been able to detect before. Gravitational waves are the best example, right? Uh, uh, Non-classical states of light were used in the LIGO interferometer to facilitate the detection of those gravitational waves. Other applications include uh, quantum accelerometers, which can be used as kind of like a portable positioning device. This allows you to circumvent the easiness with which it is to disrupt the GPS networks that we have right now and gives you an independent mechanism for knowing where you are so and when you are, right? So obviously the defense industry is very interested in that. And finally is medical imaging uh, and understanding uh, biological systems using quantum sensors. And there's, there's very cool things you can do with detecting neuronal activity and also doing microscopy on systems without uh, getting very uh, uh, high uh, uh, signal to noise uh, uh, images of, of um, sensitive phenomena that are impossible to view otherwise. Okay, so I've told you all this stuff and you might be thinking, you know, why should I believe them? Well, um, this isn't just me saying it, right? This is a national priority. And if you go to quantum.gov, you can learn a lot about what the US government is doing here, right? And so um, they, they launched this initiative in 2018 called the National Quantum Initiative Act. And that has really spurred a huge amount of activity in both industry, academia, and in government research labs to push this forward. And what this has really led to a lot is uh, public-private sector partnerships. This is something that people realize, you know, achieving a world where we actually not only can demonstrate quantum technologies, but bring them to market. This is something where we need to work together very closely, right? And so the NQI, this act that was passed, established a economic development consortium, quantum economic development consortium called QEDC. Uh, and uh, their, their mission is to grow uh, the quantum-based industry and associated supply chains. And George Mason University is one of the founding universities of this organization. Uh, and being a part of this allows us to coordinate with academic partners all across the country, but it also allows us to be coordinating and learning about the needs of our industrial counterparts, right? So these are all the companies presently involved with the QEDC. Many of them will be familiar to you, right? Uh, if you're conventional Amazon, Googles, et cetera, uh, but some may not, right? PayPal is one, Deloitte is one, Boeing is one. And the reason why these companies that aren't explicitly involved in computing per se are members of it is because of the applications that quantum technologies can bring. Encryption security for PayPal, right? Solving large problems such as fluid dynamic problems when you're modeling aircraft for Boeing. Deloitte's here too, right? So that's, that's a whole, um, uh, an, an illustration of how quantum isn't just about physics or computer engineering. It goes beyond it. It's a useful technology that can be used to solve problems in different fields. Okay, so what are we doing here at Mason, right? So quantum at Mason, as Dr. Dave said, right, uh, is, is pretty much headed up by QSEC, which is the Quantum Science and Engineering Center here. Uh, we are seeking to improve research and education at Mason and beyond in quantum computing and algorithms, in achieving materials that host interesting quantum states that can be used as a basis for quantum technology, and also developing and deploying quantum sensing technologies. Our members are comprised from six different departments across both the uh, College of Science and the Engineering School, and we are always looking to expand further. So uh, if you have interest in, in either uh, as a student in joining someone's group or, or as a faculty member in learning more about what quantum can do for you, please reach out to any of these people. Uh, 
Uh, and we've built up some very close relationships over with NIST in Gaithersburg, as well as industrial relationships, including internship programs that are underway with MITRE and Booz Allen Hamilton. All right, so uh, this is this, you know, I don't have too much time, so I'm going to go ahead and just skip over the leadership structure here. But the main point is that uh, our, our center is divided into four main groups, material science with a focus on developing quantum materials, quantum sensing of biological magnetic phenomena, uh, quantum computing through algorithm development, and education, where we are trying to develop new courses for Mason and new degree programs for Mason that can help prepare our students to join this quantum workforce, as well as intervening at the K through 12 age group uh, with FCPS, Fairfax County Public Schools, to inspire and enable uh, the youth of today to join this, this coming field. All right. I've mentioned the QEDC. We are a founding member of that. We're also a founding member of the Mid-Atlantic Quantum Alliance, which is more of a regional hub, and I'll have a slide on that next thing, as well as the uh, Potomac Quantum Innovation Center. And so through this, we have very close, uh, tight-knit connections with industry and government partners, and that informs a lot of what we do in education as well as research. It opens up a lot of opportunities for us. Um, the Maryland Quantum or the Mid-Atlantic Quantum Alliance, it changed the name because of us, ha <laughs> ha. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Quantum Alliance is, is a more regionally focused hub, as you can see here in the, in the Northern Virginia region that involves, um, you know, universities, uh, 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 companies, and uh, 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 government labs uh, in, in, you know, it's similar to the Economic Development Course Consortium, but it's writ regionally. And by being writ regionally, uh, that allows it to be uh, able to, to uh, form stronger collaborations and pivot more quickly. Uh, and so the MQA has really uh, enabled a lot of what we'd like to be doing, and we've been able to contribute to it quite heavily as well. And in particular, we led um, Maryland Quantum Alliance efforts to uh, receive one of these landmark Quantum Link Challenge Institute, uh, Challenge Institutes, uh, which was a, a $25 million proposal, uh, uh, which was led by George Mason and involved using quantum computing, machine learning, and AI to inform material science, which would then enable the development of new quantum hardware and which would feed back into um, both the ML and, and quantum computing components by new computing hardware. So some of our other highlights from the, the 2020 years, uh, and, and I'll just focus on the ones, frankly, here that have focused on enabling students, uh, was first was the seed funding program where we were able to support three uh, uh, research projects that were uh, interdisciplinary between different departments or different colleges. Uh, and that fund, those funds predominantly went towards supporting student researchers. Uh, in terms of education, we've launched a quantum information science and engineering master's concentration in the physics department. Uh, the intent there, though, is to have that concentration serve as a prototype for enabling other departments at Mason to uh, work with us to develop their own courses that will fill the gaps in their curriculum and help their students become quantum literate. Right. Uh, and in addition, we've reached out, you know, as I've, as I've you know, beaten the, the dead horse on here to, to work with our partners in the region and beyond. Uh, in the coming year, you know, we want to push forward um, all of what I've already mentioned, but we really want to get you guys involved. Right? Both faculty, both students, both members of the community. Right? You don't need to necessarily be doing research. We're interested in promoting this really cool area of, of science and engineering. Uh, and I'm nearing... Um, you know, the end of my time. So I do briefly want to just say here, you're in for a real treat. You just got done listening to me. That's going to be the worst part of the day. Um, but today you're going to hear a lot about, you know, quantum computing. What is it, you know, from Dr. Maria Milianenko next? Next, you're going to hear about our concentrations, uh, our educational efforts here. Um, you're going to get the program, a real quantum computer at 11 a.m. So stick around for that for sure. And then in the afternoon session after our lunch break, you're going to hear a lot about what we're doing in the region to enable entrepreneurship around quantum. Right? So there's going to be two excellent talks, um, both from members of the Mid-Atlantic Quantum Alliance. Tomorrow also promises to be a uh, fantastic day. Uh, tomorrow, the sessions are kicked off by um, our quantum materials group. And they'll be talking to you about material science and what it can do for quantum technologies. 
Uh, and then uh, we're going to have a lab tour from Dr. Kang and Dr. Cressman uh, that's going to show you, you know, kind of the day to day of what is done in our labs when you're trying to make sensing technologies for, for bio applications with quantum materials. Um, I, I can't wait for Dr. Sauer's talk, you know, or we're going to learn about how you can use quantum sensors, uh, quantum sensors for magnetic fields to study brains, to find bombs, and to find dark matter, which would be a real cool thing. At 11, then we'll have a, a discussion of career opportunities in quantum uh, involving myself, MITRE, NIST, Booth Allen Hamilton, all these wonderful people right here, a lunch break. And then finally, you can see the kinds of work that your colleagues here at Mason have been doing in our virtual poster session. The platform we're using is uh, Gather Town. Uh, it's kind of game-esque, right? So um, the lecture hall here will, uh, if you take your little avatar, it creates and move it in there. Uh, you can you can uh, listen to these wonderful talks. It'll give you the Zoom link. Uh, you know, there's going to be uh, Q and A rooms here for after each seminar. I unfortunately have to go to a doctor's appointment right now um, for my daughter, but I won't. So I won't be able to do this right now. But later on, I plan to be in here. Uh, and over here, we have actually quantum gaming. And the idea with this is that if you don't know anything about quantum physics or, or quantum principles, head over here. There's a bunch of little web games that we've identified and kind of curated and posted links to here that give you the essential concept and require you to know zero physics, all right? So I hope you enjoy today. Um, you know, Thank you guys for showing up. Uh, we're just really excited to spread the news about this cool area and work with our friends across the region. Uh, and I hope your take home messages are that this quantum technology stuff can impact fields beyond just high technology. Uh, and now is a perfect time, especially if you're a student, to gain literacy in quantum technologies and also gain research experience. And we at Mason are excited to help you launch a career in this really, really cool space. So if you want to learn more, um, stay. Listen, contact any speaker from today and check out our center's website. Thank you guys very much. I guess I'll take a minute or two of questions because as always, I've run over. Thank you, Patrick, great talk. Um, I guess it's time for questions. Um, you can either um, unmute yourself and ask questions or put your questions in chat. Um, I do have some pre-registered um, questions here. One of them, I guess, is for the students. Um, so it's all cool stuff in quantum over here. But uh, as a first year undergrad student or even high school student, um, where do you think they can start? And how for they can start? For a middle school student or a high school student? Yeah, and or for like first year graduate students? Yeah, I mean, so the first year, um... Oh, that's a good question. So the first year for, for students, um, I think the best thing that you can do is reach out to a member of the center and you can reach out to me, um, you can reach out to Fangu, anybody on that on that list here. So let me go back to that. Um, and, um, you know, uh, doing that will help you get a better understanding of where things lie. And um, it will also help you find a mentor within your department or, you um, in another department who works in this area and can help guide you on a path this way. Um, for middle school and high school, uh, the most important thing I think if you're interested is to um, try to learn more. Um, to, there are so many online resources available on quantum and 99% of them are free. Um, the programming of the quantum computer stuff, uh, IBM quiz kit may sound very intimidating at first mention, but uh, it again doesn't require knowledge of quantum physics. It just requires rule understanding. Um, so, you know, if you're comfortable playing video games where characters can do things like shoot lightning bolts and stuff, the rules of physics are altered. You know, and you can accept that this is kind of similar, right? The physics doesn't work the way it does in your normal everyday experience. It's a little bit different. Right? So if you can accept that, you can learn how to do the programming of the quantum computer. And you know, talk to your teachers if you're in middle school and high school. Tell them you have interest in this. Um, they may know a lot about it. They might be willing to start a club about it. You know, there might be a lot that can go on here. 
And again, reach out to us. You know, we'd love to get involved with um, uh, the community uh, around us and, and um, you know, help, help people learn more about this really exciting field.